In Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and Luke 11, 1 through 4, Jesus is teaching on prayer. The Lord's teaching on prayer, and the disciples had come to him as he was praying, and they desired to be taught about prayer. Can I just dive in this morning? Can I just go ahead for it? Amen. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go. Are you ready? Will you go with me here? All right. I, th I think about a third of you are ready to go with me. Lord, get the rest of them. Just, we're just going to go right along here. And uh, they desired to be taught about prayer, the disciples, because they had seen something in Jesus, in his life, that they wanted. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, I believe that we're living in a time when, when this series that we're starting right now on Memorial Day weekend, when, the, when they said to the, to the Lord, teach us to pray, and I begin to realize maybe many of you are here and you love the Lord, but you, you're maybe scared about prayer or you're nervous about prayer. You're not sure what prayer is all about. You're not sure how to pray. And I realized as in, this, um, in this year at Calvary when God is doing tremendous things that one of the things that we felt to be so high on the list of things that are important this year is prayer. And if we're going to pray more and if we're going to understand prayer, we need to be taught. And um, the disciples wanted to be gripped by the same passion for prayer to the Father that Jesus had. And so what does Jesus do? He answers them. He teaches them. And the prayer he gave them was not really intended to be a memorized prayer, though it's been memorized by millions and many quote the Lord's Prayer and, and that's okay, but I, when I study this, I realize he wasn't giving, he wasn't teaching us how to pray by, by giving us the Lord's Prayer to memorize as much as he, it was to build a framework, a framework to build our own prayers or our own communication with our God from our heart. We're not really to pray in vain repetition. We're not really to pray, quote, memorized prayers, not that Prayers that we write are wrong because they're not wrong, but prayers need to come from the heart, need to be communication. Uh, how many know there's something different when I look in the wife, in my wife's eyes, and I tell her from my heart, I love you, honey, and I'm so thankful God put you in my life, rather than reading to her something that somebody else wrote to their wife. It don't quite have the same effect, right? Are you with me? And so the Lord was teaching us how to pray. And learning how to pray effectively will help us to see the things that God has put in our hearts for Calvary in 2018 to come in fulfillment as we love people to life. Our vision, our motto statement, loving people to life. And, and in that way, in 2018, we're talking about helping others to know Jesus. We're talking about a th believe in God for a thousand people in our Quad Cities to come to faith and know Jesus. We want to fill up every church, not just Calvary, but churches across the Quad Cities that preach the message of the gospel. We want to see every church filling up for the cause of Jesus Christ. And so we want to see more people for the kingdom in 2018. We want an increase in our prayer lives. Uh, in case you hadn't caught on yet, because I've only said it 4,700 times already this year, but if, if you're a slow bloomer, praise God, you're here. Come along with me. I'm a slow bloomer too. I would have been a pro basketball player, but by the time my body would cooperate, my mind didn't, and when my mind would, my body got too old. I never got it together. Some of you maybe are slow bloomers, but you're here, and you're going to get it because the Holy Spirit's going to make it real, and as you practice it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help. We're saying more prayer in our daily living. Every time our life groups meet, every time we meet with a brother or sister for coffee, every time we have lunch, every time we eat, every time we get up in the morning, we're going to start with prayer on our lips and close out our evening with prayer on our lips. More prayer. We want to we just stay in the present. Paul said, I prayed without ceasing. Now, that didn't mean he stopped and prayed prayers without doing anything. That means along the way, Jesus was on his lips. How many know we can get to a place where we're, we're walking in the presence of God, realizing his presence is always there? Wouldn't that be great if we would walk more in the presence of God? 
Amen? Some, some of you maybe haven't experienced the presence of God since last Sunday when you were here at Calvary. But we ought to be walking in the presence, living in his presence. And so also that we would take next steps of our journey of faith. Many were water baptized here a few days ago. They took a step in their journey. Some of you are now serving your church and serving in Servolution and serving outreach ministries in our community. Many of you are getting involved in relationships and, and, and biblical studies and, and praying and, and doing things that connect you with the body of Christ. This is what we're saying and believing that winning is for all of us. And then finally, keeping Jesus at the center of our lives, at the center of our families, that Jesus, we're keeping the main thing, the main thing, and that's Jesus. And so as we apply, apply the Lord's teaching on prayer, we gain a deeper and stronger prayer life. Let me read you our text, and I, I hesitated, but I'm going to read you our text today, listen now, from the King James Version. Because when I was a kid memorizing scripture, I memorized scripture in the King James. That's the only thing they preached when I was a kid. That kind of dates me. That was a long time ago. And my, 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 whenever, I, whenever I quote scripture from my heart, it always comes out King James because that's how I learned it. And I tried to bring the Lord's Prayer to you from another version today, and I just couldn't get there. So, so bear with me here. I'm going to give it to you the way I learned it. The text is Matthew 6, 9 through 13. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to look at the first six words of the Lord's Prayer today. Our Father, which art in heaven. If you've got your app or you've got your outline, you've got, you're ready to take notes, you're ready to learn, we're going to learn how to pray together. We're going to learn the meaning of prayer in this series and we're going to dive in and I believe God's going to give something special to every one of us starting today. These six words contain a wealth of truth and in this first message entitled prayer is about resting we want to learn how to find our rest in our time of prayer with the Lord. N not not rest, I mean some of you when you pray you're, you're, you want to go to sleep some of you pray such boring prayers, they put God to sleep too. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But, but we, you know, so I say every time I get ready to pray, Pastor, I, I get tired, you know. But isn't it like the enemy to do anything he can to rob us of a prayer life, to keep us busy, keep us tired, keep us something, because the devil hates it because he knows what happens when we get into the presence of God and begin to pray. And begin to minister to the Lord and him minister to us. And we have communication with God. So these first six words, number one, they speak about a relationship. First of all, letter A, God is called our Father. What a wonderful truth. We may approach him knowing that he's our Father. I'm glad to know this morning that God is our Father. When God created man or made man in his image in Genesis 1.26, God became the father of the human race in creation. But when man fell into sin, man received a new father, the Bible says in John 8.44, the devil. So now the only way any of us can experience the fatherhood of God is through the new birth. John 3, 3 and, and also verse 7. Nicole and Nate today got a new father this morning. They're, they're, they traded in the father devil over their lives for father God over their lives. They, they got a new father. We must be born by his spirit, saved by his grace, and washed in his blood. Otherwise, we have no right to call him our father. But when the new birth takes place, we're adopted, the Bible says, into his family. Let me read it to you in Romans 8, 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves, 
Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. When Nate and Nicole declared the word of God over their lives, they repented of their sins. They, 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 they obeyed that call of God, the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of their heart. And Jesus came into their lives. They received a new father. They were adopted into the kingdom of our great God. They've become his. It's a wonderful thing to realize that God is our father. That's one of the reasons that the enemy of our life and the enemy in America tries to distort the meaning and definition of a father. I had somebody tell me when I, 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 I pray so much, uh, our father, our great God, our father. I, I, I use the word father much when I pray because I believe it's appropriate. And I've had a few people along the way in pastoring our church say, you know, it, it always, I've never looked at prayer as thinking about God as a father because I didn't have a father. And I, when I think of father, I don't relate good things in my life. And I told him, hey, I want to tell you, you may not have a father or had much of a father influence on your life here, but if you're a child of God, you've got a good, good father. Amen. You've got a heavenly father who loves you. No one in the kingdom is fatherless. We see this in Galatians 4 and Ephesians 1. When we're saved, we instantly become the children of God, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. This new relationship opens up the avenues of access into his presence as our Father. B, most ancient religions could not conceive of God as Father. The Jews understood it better than most, but they had many names for God which they often used when they prayed. Names for God if they were in need. They had a name for God if they were in need. They had a name for God if they needed peace. Uh, they had a name for God if they were afraid. Or they had another name for God if they needed a pastor or a shepherd. Uh, they had another name for God if they were sick. They had a big list of names for God depending on what their needs were. But when Jesus instructed his disciples in prayer, I believe as I read this and as I study this, I begin to realize something here. He basically instructs them to forget all the formulas and forget the complicated names and forget all the frustrations of trying to figure out exactly which name to use for God and just say, Our Father. Our Father. Can I preach a little bit here this morning? I know it's holiday weekend and you're all are taking some time off, but I'm not off, I'm on. I got a word in my spirit, I'm ready. Lock them doors, ushers, I'm going to give a full mother load here. They're not working tomorrow, I'm gonna, we're going to go for it. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Guest, I'm just kidding, kind of. I don't have to try and figure out which name of God I need to use. I just run to him and say, Daddy, Abba, Father, call out to him. Let her see, since God is our Father, he carries us in his heart and has our best interest. Look at me, saints of God. Your Father God has your best interest. There are many in our land today and in our world who can create children. That does not mean they father them. But our God not only births us into his family. Nate and Nicole, God not only births you into his kingdom today, he has the will, the resources, and the ability to father you. He has promised to sustain us, supply us, and care for us until we arrive home in glory. Matthew 6, 25 through 34, Matthew 10, and Philippians 4, 19. We earthly fathers have times when our resources are not sufficient to meet our children's needs. There are times when Reese and Riley want more than Daddy knows how to give them. 
Somebody understands what I just said there. But our Heavenly Father never has that challenge. Our Bible says He's the all-sufficient one. He has all we need and more. He's the God of more than enough. Not the God of barely enough. He's the God of more than enough. He has more than we need. In fact, his supply never runs out. Hello. And he's my father. And he never runs out. He's all we need and more. Psalms 24, 1. Psalms 50 and verse 10. And he's well able, the Bible says in Ephesians 3, 20, to meet our needs. Letter D, we can rest in our relationship with him knowing that when we call on him, he hears us because he loves us and cares about what we face. He's our father and he's called us into his presence. Let me say that again, you missed a chance to say amen. He's our heavenly father and he's called us into his presence. Jeremiah 33, 3, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Hebrews 4, 16. Prayer is about resting. These six words, our Father which art in heaven. They speak about a relationship. God is our Father. Secondly, they also speak about a reality. Letter A, the next two words, which art, are filled with glory and wonder. They remind us that we serve a God who exists and that he's more than a figment of our imagination. In fact, faith in the existence of God is the very ground on which we may approach him. Listen to this now in light of what I just told you, Hebrews eleven six, And it is impossible to please God without faith, anyone who wants to come to him. If anybody here wants to come to God, if you want to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Amen. This verse teaches us that we must believe that God exists and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Oh, I love that. There's so much there. Letter B, we serve a God who is. He's not a God who was. Oh, I, I could just get blessed just thinking about this. He's not a God who was. He's not a God who will be someday. But as he told Moses in Exodus 3.14, his name is I am that I am. He's not I was. He's not I will be. He's I am. This reminds us this morning that our God is the self-existent eternal one from all eternity past right now in the present and he will continue unchanged in the vast reaches of eternity future since God is the eternal I am he does not dwell in the past he does not exist in the future our God is a right now on time God you see that's why we must become a right now people in God in his presence right now because the enemy tries to get us into our past the enemy will try to tell you about how much you don't deserve in God because of your messed up past and if that don't work he'll try to get into our young people's heads and tell them they don't have a future look at the way the world is look how things are going look at the mess the things are you might as well just end it all right now why does the devil try to get people in their past and if that don't work he tries to mess with them and get them too far into their future the reason is because because the devil can't mess with people that are in there now because God is now God is I am he's right now there is therefore now Romans 8 says no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit we we can be a right now people. We don't have to worry about our past. There isn't one thing worrying is going to help you dealing with your past. The only thing that will help you deal with your past is the blood of Jesus. Amen. That draws a line and says that was then, this is now. Go ahead. Go forward. Learn from the past, but don't resort to it. Walk into all that I have planned and purpose for you. How do I head towards my future? Live for me today. Be right now. 
Be where you are right now because if you're in my presence right now. You see, God put us in something that he don't live in. He put us in something called time. We see time as past and present and future. And God, because he's the eternal I am, sees past, present, and future as all one eternal now in the mind of God. He, he sees the future as well as he sees the past because to him it's all right now. Do I understand everything I just preached right there? No. <laughs> then why did you say it? Because the word of God goes past my ability to understand and taps into the faith that he gave me to believe that what he said is true. And he said, I am. I'm having fun now. Let her see, since God is real and he doesn't change, we can approach him with confidence, resting in his reality. Prayer is not a pointless exercise, saints. It's not merely sending up words into the air. Prayer is a humble heart approaching a holy heavenly father. Prayer is a redeemed child of God entering the presence of a holy God to conduct heavenly business at the throne of grace. Because God is real, prayer is real. Because God is real, there is power in prayer. Because the God that you and I serve is not in some grave somewhere dead, but he's alive. And because he's alive, prayer is heard from a God that's alive who answers <laughs> prayer. We can rest in that hope and exercise our privilege of entering into his presence. Prayer is about resting. I want you to know when you get a hold of this little message this morning, when we get a hold of it, that we'll find rest in God. We'll find that these six words speak about a relationship. God is our Father. They speak about a reality that our God exists. And thirdly, they speak about a realization. Letter A, when the Bible tells us that our Father dwells in heaven, it's telling us that he occupies a place of honor, glory, and power. Our Father which art in heaven. Now think about this. Since he's in heaven, do you understand God's in heaven right now? And since he's in heaven, he's above the evil and the problems of this world. Since he's in heaven, he's in a position to move in power and in a position to respond to us. Since our God is in heaven, he's not He's not in some hell hole here in the world. He is not in some messed up mess in some inner city. He is not in some God forsaken place. The God that we serve is in heaven, high above all things. He is in authority. He is all powerful. He is almighty. Our Father, which art in heaven. He's in a position that we might exalt him. He's in a position that we might honor him with our prayers. I want you to know that when you pray, one of the great privileges you have is to honor his name, to lift him up, to, to magnify where he is. He's in heaven, which means he's high above and has all authority over every situation as we submit ourselves to him. Letter B, this suggests some things we need to take into account when we pray. Number one, we should enter his, enter his presence humbly. Our Father is God. He made this world. He's holy. He's wonderful. And were it not for the cleansing blood of Jesus, we would have no right to enter his presence. In fact, when we do enter, we can only do so through Jesus, our Savior, and our mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5, that says there is only one mediator between God and man. And that man is Christ Jesus. There's only one. There's only one mediator between us and God. And that is Jesus Christ. Not the Virgin Mary. Not your grandmother. Not your dad. Not your grandpa. Not your grandma who's in heaven. There is only one mediator between God and man. And that man is Jesus Christ. When we come into God's presence, our Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And we can be assured of an audience and an answer. John 14, John 15, John 16. 
Number two, we should enter his presence confidently. Now that may sound like a contradiction for us to enter humbly, and now I'm saying confidently. But it's not a contradiction. Even as we humble ourselves before him, we also pray in faith, believing that God will hear us and answer us for his acclaim, for his glory, for his magnification. To approach him in doubt, listen to me carefully now, to approach our God in doubt is to slam the door of prayer. To approach him in doubt is to slam the door of prayer. James 1, 6 and 8. But to approach him in simple faith is to guarantee the success of our prayers. Matthew 21, 22, Mark 11, 22, and 1 Timothy 2, 8. Number three, we should enter his presence worshipfully. Humbly, confidently, and worshipfully. When we approach the Lord in prayer, we need to remember to whom we are speaking. He is God. He is Lord. He is awesome. Let us therefore come into his presence to worship, honor, and glorify him. And number four, we should enter his presence hopefully. Our Father is in heaven. Listen to me, our Father is already in our heavenly home, and he awaits our appearance there. I don't know if you like that or not, but your God is awaiting for your appearance there with him. So when we pray, we're turning our attention toward the eternal homeland that awaits us. Every time you pray, there's a part of you that that needs to understand when we stop and we recognize that we're in the presence of God and that we're praying to our Father and that we are humbly coming before Him with the confidence that His Word is true and that we can pray in the wonderful name of Jesus who saved us by His blood, that we can understand that as we come to pray, we're honoring Him and glorify Him and we recognize that He is in our eternal home and, and He's awaiting our arrival. We're not seeking answers to prayers that are rooted in the troubles and problems of this life. We're seeking heavenly spiritual benefits which originate in our new home. You, you, we, we need to understand that when we pray, we're establishing and rooting ourselves into the eternal care and protection and blessings of God that we have in the heavenlies even while we're here on earth. May we not crave too much of this world. Let our prayers be born out of a desire to see heaven blossom here on earth. Every saint of God who's felt the breezes of glory in their souls and has heard the tender voice of the Father in fellowship with him, there is a desire within all of us to go home. Now, some of us want to delay that for a moment, like the little boy in Sunday school who's, where the teacher said, who wants to go to heaven? And every, all the kids raised their hand except little Johnny. And she said, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, oh, yes, I want to go to heaven. I thought you were taking a load up right now. <laughs> Let her see as we pray in faith, we can rest in the sure knowledge that our Father is God, that he is in heaven that he occupies the throne of glory, that he sees and knows everything there is to know about us and that he will hear and answer. God is there and not here. His presence is here. His spirit is here. Jesus lives in our heart, but God the Father is in heaven. He's not here. When we pray in faith, we leave the burdens of the world behind and we enter into his presence. One more thing today. These six words speak about a responsibility. Notice that God is called our Father, not just my Father or just your Father. He's our Father. That reminds us that when we pray, we're part of God's family. Letter B, we have the duty before the Lord to pray for one another. We carry one another's burdens to the throne of grace. Look at this verse in Galatians 6, 2. Share each other's burdens, and in this way we obey the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Jesus fulfilled the law, and he said, listen, you don't have to worry anymore. Since Jesus came, about the 600 laws in the law of the Old Testament, all we have to do is remember two things. Boy, I'm glad I was born in this generation. How many are glad you don't have to remember 600? Just two. 
I thought you'd kind of get a kick out of that. I did. Just two. And there, in these two hang all the law and the prophets. Everything is fulfilled, and we'll grow in God and continue forever if we'll just do two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love one another. Love each other as yourself. We do that. Now, there's a lot in those two. There's a lot in there. But it's not so hard to remember. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, every, every part of your being. And love those people beside you as yourself. Love them rascals. Love them people that get on your nerves. Love them people that you're glad you don't have to go to work tomorrow and see their face. You can pray for them from a distance on Monday. Memorial Day, and you're not going to remember them too much tomorrow. But you pray for them. You show them kindness. It's the God kind of love that says, I don't feel like loving them. Jesus didn't feel like going to the cross and dying for me, but he did it anyway. We have a duty before the Lord to pray for one another. Letter C, being a part of a family means that I have no right to pray for things that are selfish in nature. We structure our prayers so that they reflect what is best for the whole family of God, not what is just best for me. And last, I can rest in prayer when I accept my responsibility to pray for what is best for the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. How many know that we serve a good father today who is perfect in all of his ways and that we are loved by him? We can rest in our spirit when we pray. Jeff, lead us a little bit in that wonderful little chorus before we pray. Oh, and I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, oh, but I thank you, Lord, that Jesus taught us to pray. The prayers of a righteous man or woman, the Bible says, avails much. Thank you that we get to pray. And Lord, prayer is not so much about us trying to get you to do what we want. Prayer becomes more about us lining up with your plans, being in your presence, recognizing you as our Father. Lord, let us more and more become a people of prayer at Calvary, a people that bathe ourselves in the presence and prayer and declaration of who you are. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you be seated for one moment as Jordan comes up? We have an announcement to make before we turn you loose this morning and dismiss you today. And um, God bless you all. We love you so much.